everybody. Welcome to the Digital Cathedral this morning. Always, always, always good to be with you on a Sunday morning. I look forward to this time together. And uh, frankly, we're going to get into some good things. Are you ready for an adventure? Can I take you on a journey over the next several weeks uh, in a way I've never done before? I'm going to try, first of all, I'm going to try to keep what I'm doing at the Digital Cathedral and what I'm doing at the Grace Awakening Network running together on a parallel track. Now, obviously, I only have 28 minutes on my television program. I've got, I've got more time than that here, so I'm going to be able to go deeper here than I am on television, but that's probably okay because <clears throat> those of you that are here at the Digital Cathedral probably are running a little bit deeper than the average member uh, viewer on the Grace Awakening Network. Here's the journey I want to take. Let me preface it by saying one of my favorite scriptures, and I've read it often at the, at the Digital Cathedral. We've done some study on it. It's Romans chapter 8 and verse 19, Keithley translation. It says, for all of creation is looking for, some, some versions say groaning, some say with great expectation. I think, I can't remember the translation, but one translation says that creation is standing on tiptoe expectation, looking for the manifestation of the sons of God. Now here's where we're going to go. Here's where the journey's going to take us. I don't think we have broken down what that means to come to that place when we manifest as a son of God. Everyone that just is awakened is not ready to manifest. Now, there are several words in the New Testament that deal with sonship, and we're going to go through those, but we're going to look at more than just that. What I want to do is to talk to you about the entirety of the journey to where we can manifest as sons of God with the, with the target of reaching the measure, the stature, the fullness of Christ. So we're going to talk about how the Father disciplines sons, uh, tests of preparation that you might experience as you evolve into maturity and become that son as Jesus is in his present world, so are you. Uh, many of us are coming through that process that Jesus went through in his early life when he grew in stature, favor, and wisdom with God and man. So this is going to be a fun venture. I want you to just set back, strap in, and be ready to go. Uh, we're, we're going to cover maybe some familiar ground, but I think I'm going to expose some things that will help you in this journey of sonship. And when I say sonship, I mean daughterhood. So I, I, may, I may not say daughters every time I say sons, because we're just accustomed to saying sons of God, which takes in male, female. It's not gender specific. Fair enough? So we're going we're gonna to walk through this process, and it's, I'm going to be fairly detailed. So, I mean, I've got, I got a legal pad full of notes, scriptures, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to highlight and bring out as we go through this. And, and because it's a journey, I'm, I'm going to... This teaching is going to kind of be like a train. You know, a train is connected, each car is connected. I can disconnect it and connect it from week to week. So I don't have a goal. I don't have a target as to where I'm going to go every week. I probably will name the, te the teachings by different names because I've learned from experience if I do part one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <clears throat> that people, as the parts grow, people tend to watch less because they've missed a couple parts or they didn't see the first one. And so they don't make the journey. So on this one, it is going to be a continual flow, both here at the Digital Cathedral and on the Grace Awakening Network, television network. And if you're not watching GAN, brother, you need to get your Roku revved up because we've got, I think right now we're at about 85 different programs that runs 24-7. And it's all gospel, it's all good news. Everything we study here we, is taken over there from any number of outstanding, excellent teachers and different presentations. So I want you to, to go to again. But I, in my, my program again, I'm not going to dive as deep as I am here. So stay with me every week. If you miss one, be sure to come back and look at it. Because we're going to build one teaching on top of the other. So we're going to talk about sonship development. And this is so important to understand on the journey. I don't know why it has not been emphasized more. I'm not talking about discipleship. 
in my, my, my view, discipleship was pre-cross. Jesus talked about making disciples. After the cross, it's more about sonship. Paul was into sonship. I, I, I don't want to say Paul never used the word disciple, but he certainly used the word sons and daughters, right? Sons and daughters. He didn't use daughters as much as sons. But that development, that whole process. So that's what we're going to go through. And I think you're going to find that this is going to help you to pinpoint exactly where you're at on the journey and what you can expect as you continue to progress and mature until you reach the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ. All right. So on the journey of sonship, let me just let me just go back a minute. As you make this journey of sonship, there are two things that you have got to get rock solid foundation in your thinking. And you cannot question these. If you're going to grow as a son of God, you cannot question these. This, this is what Jesus worked off of. All right? Number one thing is this. Number one and two are not priorities. It's just I'm numbering one and two. Number one is this. You have got to be entirely convinced that the Father is only good. He's only good. I know you've read stuff in the Old Testament and you've heard teaching from Old Testament, but you got to nail this down. The Father that we serve is only good. In fact, 1 John chapter 5, 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, out of the Passion Translation says this. I think this highlights it so well. This is the life-giving message we heard and share. So Paul, uh, John is talking firsthand information, giving you testimony, word for word. This is the life-giving message we heard and share, and it's still ringing in our ears. We now repeat his words to you. So these are the words that Jesus spoke, John picked up on, wrote down, and John said, here's the words that Jesus spoke to you. God is pure light. God is pure light. You'll never find even a trace of, or a hint, or a smidgen of darkness in him. Anything that you look at would say that's, that's wickedness, that's uh, a cause of cruelty, hypocrisy, injustice, that does not come from the Father. And I, I want you to get this re really hammered down tight because of where we're going to go over the next weeks. You have got to be resolved over this issue that the Father is only good, which means you fully trust him. Because you're going to come through some things on this sonship development that I'm going to highlight. And a lot of this I'm speaking out of experience of my life as we go through this. It's what I've encountered. It's what I've experienced. It's what I've observed. But you're going to have to come to a place where you absolutely fully trust the Father. That there's no wickedness in Him. There's no murder in Him. No disease in Him. No poverty in Him. You're going to have to just lean back, let go. Let go and trust Him. I like what Charles Stanley said. Charles Stanley, bless his heart, he's a good old Baptist boy. Charles Stanley said this. He said, obey God and leave the results to him. That's trust. <clears throat> That's leaning back into him. So foundationally, if you have to meditate this, ponder it, think it over and over and over, I want you, to, for, because of where I'm going to take you, you've got to understand the Father is only good. You trust him. You've released yourself into his care, into his protection, and into his hands. All right, the second thing that you have to absolutely be convinced of is that you are a beloved son. You right, right now today, you are a beloved son. I could probably spend the whole, whole teaching on this, but being a child of God is ground level zero. It's where everybody starts the process. We, we don't do anything to become a child of God. We're a child of God because of who we be, not what we do. And we be a child of God because God created us in his image and his likeness. He breathed the breath of life into our nostrils. And so we're, we're walking now and we're awakening to this. We're awakening to who we've always been, maybe didn't know it. And we're just awakening. And this is what this, this protracted series is about, is to open our eyes even further so that we can see what it means to walk as a son. So, but I want you to just get fixed. Not only is God 
only good. The Father's only good. But you qualify totally as a son right now. In in John, just a a page or two over, in in, uh, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 2, this this is how the Passion Translation says it. Beloved, we are God's children right now. However, it is not yet apparent what we shall become. That's, that's what I'm going to teach you over the next few weeks is what you are becoming. But again, the ground level zero, the starting point, you, you're all there. Don't think you have to do something, beg and plead with God, anything religious that was heaped on you. No, beloved, now are you the sons of God, and it has not yet become apparent what we shall be. But we know that when he is finally made visible, when we get revelation of him, we see him with crystal clear eyesight, spiritual eyesight. We will be just like him, for we will see him as he truly is. My heart in this, in these teachings that we're entering into is that I might make Jesus crystal clear to you. Because once he's crystal clear, what you behold, you become. So I'm going I'm to really carve him out and teach you, let you know, that you are the exact image of the firstborn. And I hope when I'm done with this, that you'll be able to say, Jesus said, I hope you'll be able to say, Jesus said, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Nothing would thrill this old man's heart more than for you to say with boldness and confidence, if you've seen me, you have seen Jesus. So those two things, and I've taken a little bit of time on it, because if we don't get the foundation right, the building's not going to be correct. Take a little bit of time, lay this down, and I don't want you to ever forget the Father is only good. Now, don't just get it up here. Get it down here. Let it, let it drop. Or Matter of fact, let me just talk to your spirit man. I, that's pretty inaccurate Say, let it go from here to here. I would rather go from here to here. So once your spirit is convinced of it, once your inner man knows the Father's only good and your beloved son right now, today, you're not, you're not where we're going. The, the child is just the start of the process. It's not where we're going to end up. And I'm probably going to introduce you to a word called theosis. It means uh, deification, divinization. Theosis. We'll get into that word a little bit, but it's going to be way, way down the road in a few weeks. I'm just going to start at ground level zero. So know those two things. Now let's start to look at a passage of Scripture that deals with the development that we come through. Galatians chapter 4. I'm going to read this out of the New King James. I'm going to read the first seven verses out of chapter 4. And I'm going to point three things out from these seven verses that are, that are he- going to help you to begin to see where Paul's going with sonship, manifesting as a son. Galatians chapter 4, verse 1 says this, And I say that the heir, as long as he's a child, does not differ at all from a slave, though he's master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so we, when we were children, and there's a specific specific word there that we're going to get into, not this week, but maybe next week. When we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of, as sons and because you are sons see that's it that's in full agreement with what we just read from first john chapter 3 verse 2 beloved now are you the sons of god the children of god and then paul paul says right here because you are sons god has sent forth the spirit of his son into your heart do you recognize that today that there's a spirit that has been given to you by grace whereby we can cry out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are an heir of God through Christ. <clears throat> now, in that passage, that's a great passage of Scripture that outlines a little bit of sonship development from 30,000 feet. You kind of get an overview. And he's, he's talking about sonship development in there from immaturity to maturity. What we're seeing in that passage of Scripture, number one, is that you have a higher calling than being 
a servant. You have a call to sonship. Okay? Are, are you with me? You're not called to be a servant. Um, in, in the fourth chapter of Galatians, we just read a little bit, first seven verses. Let me come down to verse 19. My little children, of whom I tr labor in birth again, until Christ is formed in you. I would like to pre present with you now and to change my tone, for I have doubts about you. All right. So w what he's saying here is my little, ch little children, of whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Now, these were not mature people in Galatians. They just came into the message. I want you to just notice that word formed uh, because it speaks about the, the journey we're on. It speaks about becoming mature. The word formed there means to be in complete harmony with the mind and the life of Christ, right? Paul, and I mentioned it, you could say it's coming to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But the word formed is an important word because it, it shows us that there's something that's going on. The potter has that clay on the wheel. He's forming it, right? He's forming it. It's not perfect yet. So we're on the potter's wheel, and the, the Spirit of Truth is forming us. He's bringing us into absolute, complete harmony with the mind and with the life of Christ. That's where we're going on this trip. So in these first uh, seven verses, back to Galatians chapter 4 that we just read, it's a great passage that outlines sonship development from maturity, immaturity to maturity. So you've got a higher calling than that of being a servant. And I know what they told you down to church. We're just here to, to, to serve the Lord, right? That, that's fine. That's fine. But you've got a higher calling than that. There's three people mentioned in that passage of Scripture in Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And if you have your Bible open, I want you just to underline them, right? First of all, he says, a servant. This first person mentioned is a servant. A servant is interesting because a servant has no position. Servant has no potential. A servant has no, no future. A servant has gone as far as he's going by being a servant. Now, you servant can be happy. He can live his whole life just being a servant, and that's fine. You can live your whole life long as a servant, and that's what people basically are living that have been told everything's about going to heaven. So that's why they told you down the church house, you're just a servant. You're a servant because everything was put off futuristically to when you die and you go to heaven. That's where all the good stuff was. So the first person he mentions is a servant. Here's what I want you to remember about a servant. A servant has no position, no potential, and no future. He's right where he's going to stay for, for a long, long, long time. Second person he mentions in that passage of Scripture is the child heir. Now, the child heir it has, has position. He's a child heir. He has potential, but he's immature. So he, ha he has no, no real possession yet. He's got potential. He's got position, but no possession. And 90% 90, 90 of believers live in frustration because they've stopped at that position of being a child. They've seen the, they've seen the potential that a, that a son has. They've seen the position they should occupy. But because they're immature, they're not experiencing, they're not walking in a position of being a manifested son, to, a son of God. They're still under what Paul says under external controls still under laws, still under disciplines. Uh, they have no power, no authority. And they basically, what Paul said, function as a servant, even though they are Lord of everything. We heard so much back in my charismatic days about who we are in Christ, but nobody ever told us what, who we really were, nor, nor did anybody ever teach us how to develop in who we are. We just, that was a buzz phrase. You got to know who you are in Christ. So we remained immature. We had no authority, no power, no strength. 
We were under external controls of church laws, of regulations, of rules, of laws. So we basically were functioning no better than a servant. Now the third person that he mentions is a son. The servant, the child there, and the son. The son is the one that takes his place. He takes ownership. And as he grows and matures, the authority and the release from the father is slowly given to him. So as we go through this series, I want you to understand that the father's authority is released slowly. The power is released slowly. But we want to come to that place where we begin to take ownership. This is kingdom living. That's what the kingdom is about. It's about taking ownership. Your book says that God has kept the heavens for his, but he's given the earth to the sons of men to have authority and to rule over it. So we see a progression there. We go from uh, a child heir that has position, has potential, but no power, no authority. And then we, we see the son, as Paul describes it, as one that takes place. He has ownership, he's grown, he's developed, and he's being released. That day, that day of release is upon him. So there, there's progression. John chapter 1 verse 12 lays it out well. John chapter 1 verse 12. I don't know how far I'm going to get today, but I, I want to get far enough that I'm just planting vision with you today, challenging your heart, trying to stir you up a little bit, that wherever you're at in this journey, we need to progress further. And I want you to fully understand ground level, starting point. Now we're children. Now we're sons. Now we're daughters. But we are not to remain there. That's, that's where the message has been faulty. We don't remain in that position. We don't remain in that place. We are to grow beyond it. John chapter 1 verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. So there you get To as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become, progress, grow into that position as children of God. Now, let me just say this. Receive is such a hijacked word from religion. Re receive is not what you do. Receiving is not a doing. Receiving in Scripture is basically an acknowledgement of what grace has already deposited. You acknowledge it. See, see, you can't receive anything that grace is not already given. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Therefore, I can receive it. I can acknowledge it. When I acknowledge it, it begins to pr produce a shift in my consciousness, in the way that I view things. I, part of kingdom living is understanding that you do have everything that pertains to life and godliness. Now, as we acknowledge it, as we accept it, number one, because the Father's only good, and number two, because you're a child right now. That's the basis, right? That's our foundation. So you begin to understand now what he has given to you by grace. But I want you to see in John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as receive him, as acknowledge what grace has given, whose eyes are opening up to those ones, he has given the power and the ability to progress, to develop, to become sons of God. So that it, it, it clearly indicates a sonship development. There is, there is a becoming as a son. We, we have one word, son, but that's not the way it breaks out in the Greek. When you awaken to the fact that you are and have always been a child of God, the process begins. Do you, do you, do you understand why a lot of people back at your church, charismatic church, Baptist church, evangelical, wherever you went to church, a lot of people were stunted in their growth because they never had the awareness of who they had always been. They were trying to become who they already were. They were trying to get something they already possessed. So now that you and I have moved through that veil and we're seeing, then we're able to take that next, that next step. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Let's, let's see what we got over there. Philippians, Galatians, Ephesians, 
Philippians, Colossians, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. He says, do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. There again, we're progressing, we're growing. There is a light that lights every man that has come into the world. That's Jesus, first chapter of John. He is the light that lights every man that comes into the world. And you're shining as a light. Your, your, your wattage is increasing, right? Do all things without complaining and disputing that you may become blameless and harmless. In God's eyes, you already are blameless and harmless. You're perfect in his eyes. But to the eyes of the world, there is a development where when they see you, they see Jesus. Where they look at your life and they say, man, what, what is it about you that is different? What is it about you that you don't murmur? You don't complain? You don't put people down? You, you don't speak perversely of situations? What, what is clicking in your life? That's when your light is shining and you're beginning to show forth as a sun. But again, in uh, Philippians 2, 14, 15, you see the process of becoming, of walking to maturity and becoming, becoming, I probably should have mentioned this earlier, becoming is, in this passage, is Strong's word 1096 in the, in the Greek concordance, 1096, and it means to emerge. It means to transition. It means to go from one point to another. So when he's talking about becoming, he's talking about emerging, transitioning. It's, it's a little bit uh, like a butterfly, like a, a caterpillar becomes a butterfly. It starts out as a caterpillar, but it grows, it progresses, it transitions. Uh, the word uh, is, is metamorpho. We get the word metamorphosis from it. It means to become what you weren't before. And that's the power of this progression, man. When you, as you continue to progress, you're going to stand back and look at yourself, say, I, I see the change. I, I see the difference in my attitude, my perspective, the way I handle situations. Things don't get under my skin anymore. Big things don't move me. Little things, I just brush them off. I'm, I'm not susceptible to the dictates of the world and what, what's got everybody else in fear and trembling and wondering about tomorrow. I've moved beyond that. I'm settled in. I know that my father is only good and I know that I'm a beloved son right now. So I am now awakening to who, I, who I've always been. I love it. I love it. Basically, there are four words in, in the Greek language that mark our sonship development. And they're progressive. And they define what we are becoming. So I'm, as I go through these words, probably starting next week, I'm going to use some illustrations from the natural so you can see the development in the spiritual. Because we know naturally, we, we, we don't, uh, at, at 10 years old, you're not mature enough to drive a car. Not 16, you might be mature enough to drive a car, but you're not old enough to get married. Right? You're, not, you're not at that maturity level yet. So there's a, there's a progression. And as I go through this, I want you to be able to mark your place where you think you are in the journey. Now these four, I'm going to give you four words, not today, but I, I want you to understand before we ever get there, that they're not like graduating or going from the third grade to the fourth grade where it's cut and dried. Okay, You, you might be very mature in some area and immature in other areas. And I'll just interject this. The areas that you're still immature in are going to be the areas that God works with you. He disciples you. He dis I forget the word disciple. I meant to say he disciplines you. This is where he, he begins to mess with you. And he begins to try to get you to see in a way that you've never seen before. So I want, you, I want to help you understand yourself. And I want you to, as we go through it, not be too hard on yourself. Because as we get to that mature son, you may say, man, I'm not, that, that seems like a far stretch for me. Don't enjoy the journey. Trust the process. The father knows what he's doing. It is, it is in fact, a progressive walk. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, you can, you can rest in this one. 
Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6 says, Being confident of this very thing, that he that began a good work in you, he that took you over there when you were just a child heir, when you just had your peepers open just a little bit and you were getting a little bit of light. This very thing, he that began a good work in you will complete it unto the day of Jesus Christ. Or until that day when you are fully in harmony with the mind of Christ and the life of Christ. He's just going to continue to work, continue to chisel, continue to knock off those parts of your life that don't look like Jesus. That's not hard to understand, is it? All right, and then in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. So we just read Philippians 1.16, relax, trust the process, enjoy the journey. And then Philippians 2.13, one, one of my favorite scriptures. It says that it is God who works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's why I can trust him so much. I know that he is the one that is putting the will in me. And once he puts the will within me, then he gives me the energy, the ability, the skill to complete it. Now, at first, it might be a little bit awkward. It might be a little bit tough. First time you drove a car, especially if you learned not a standard transmission like I did, you let that clutch out and the car would jerk, but it got to go. As you grew in that, you could, you could shift those gears, just listen to the radio, just like nothing. It became second nature. And that's how this... This progression is going to be. Once you learn to submit to it, trust the Father, understand that you're a son and that you're under development, that the one who started to work is working, working faithfully, working feverishly within you, allowing you to grow as fast as you're willing to grow. He's, he's not limited by time or, or anything. He's, he's willing to take as fast as, as you want to go. Now, growing up's not always a smooth walk, is it? In the natural, it's not a smooth walk. You know, when you, I was thinking this week about that, and I was thinking back to the time I asked, I asked a girl on a date for the first time. Man, I was nervous. You, some of you guys can relate to this. I had a girl picked out, she's a beautiful young lady. I wanted, I go, man, I, I, you know, all things going through my head. I, I think she's way above me. I, I finally worked, and my hands were sweaty. I tried to rehearse ahead of time what I was going to say. And it was really difficult. I finally did spit it out. We, we went to a, a movie afterwards. Back in the day, we get hamburgers and milkshakes. And it was a great evening. Had a great time. Went out some more. Uh, I thought about that. And I thought that as I grew uh, emotionally, as I grew socially, by the time I got to college, not a problem to ask a girl out. If I see a girl you really would like to get to know better, it was, it was not as difficult. I'm, never say, I'm, I'm not going to tell you it was always easy or it was not without a little bit of apprehension, but you become much more of a smooth operator by the time you get to college than you were as a sophomore in high school. You become accustomed to it. And that's the way the journey is in sonship. The more you become accustomed to growing, the more you're going to hunger to grow, and 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 it's going to ch change you as you continually grow, right? It was a tough thing asking a girl on a date first time. Time you get to college, it, it's smooth. It's not as difficult. And then when you finally get married, man, it's an entirely different world that you've got to learn. You've got to grow and progress in that. So all of life is a is a growing process. So our father's a good father. Our father loves us. Our father takes care of us. A father always, everything that the father does comes out of love. He can't do anything other than love. But having said that, let me assure you, the father is not adverse in this development process to take you to, and I'm careful about my words here because I don't want it to sound harsh, He's, he's not adverse to take you to the spiritual woodshed, right? The, but let me, let me hasten to add this. The Father's discipline is never punishment. When he takes you to the spiritual woodshed, it is to discipline you. It's not to punish you. It's, it's, it's love that's going to burn away everything that is contrary to him. And there are going to be times <clears throat> that you see that it's contrary to him and man, it's going to kind of hurt. It's going to kind of injure you. And you're going to think, man, how could, I, how could I have been that foolish? How could I have been that naive? 
that I would not have just let that, I wouldn't have seen that for myself. See, he doesn't, he doesn't spank you with sickness. He doesn't put disease on you to teach you a lesson. My father's not into poverty. He's not going to make you begging for bread as discipline, teach you a lesson. His discipline is not to teach you a, a harsh lesson. His discipline always comes from love. And like I say, it is to, it is to just burn away, just, just get rid of those parts that are not like him, right? So there's, there's nothing in the Father's correction that you have to fear. He does not kill. He does not steal. He does not destroy. That's religion's job. Remember back over there in, in John chapter 10, when Jesus talks about the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy, and we've said, well, that's the devil. Well, actually, if you back up to John chapter 9, verse 40, from that point on, and again in John chapter 10, verse 7, he's talking to the religious people. See, religion, religion is not adverse to making you hurt, to make you uncomfortable, to try to tell you God put that on you so that you wouldn't do it again. God put sickness on you because you didn't tithe. God put, God put calamity on you. God had your house burned down because you weren't obeying him. No, that's not the way our father works. Remember, first foundation, the father's always good. He always works out of, out of love. So what does religion do? Religion scapegoats the devil. Well, it was the devil. The devil did that. You know, it was, it was God using the devil to bring all that calamity in, into your life. That's the way that religion brought it to us, where we feared God, we feared the devil. Uh, if we got out of line, if we misstepped, we thought for sure, man, that we were toast, that it wasn't going to be good for us. And so the Father corrects us. He disciplines us with his word. Growing up, I, I, I remember getting one spanking when I was five. I had a brand new bicycle and my dad said, you can ride that bike around the block. I was only five years old, but then you could. He said, you can ride the bicycle around the block. He said, but I don't, don't go any further than that. He said, I want you to keep circling so I can see you. Well, I thought I had a better plan. So I started riding my bike around the block a couple of times. That got kind of boring. So I went off further, ventured further. And I, I took longer than the, the circle around the block. So when I got back by the house, my dad stopped me. He said, did you, did you ride the bike past where you should have? I said, no, I sure didn't. So my father took me in, sat me down. And that was the only time I remember got, I got a spanking. I don't think it was a very hard spanking. But my, my dad, here's how my dad corrected me. Here's how my father disciplined me. And I think this relates a lot to the Father in heaven. My father had a look. And if we were in church or we were at a function somewhere and I was acting up, cutting up, I, I was big on that. I always had an answer, always laughing, joking. If I took it too far, my father would give me the look. And he would, he would say to me, do we need to have a man-to-man -man talk? When I was six, seven, eight, nine years old. We had man-to-man -man talk. I didn't do much talking. My father did all of the talking. But I knew the look, and I knew the voice of the father when I had the man-to-man -man talk. And I think that's kind of how the father deals with us. The Holy Spirit can give you the look from the Father. And it just kind of pricks you. Like, oh, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Now, there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ. So it's not, the, 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 the word that he speaks was not to condemn you, make you feel bad. It's just to bring correction, not punishment, but correction. And I think the Father has, has that look and he has that word. In fact, in fact, our Heavenly Father corrects us and disciplines us with the words that come from his mouth. Now watch, Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. The Father used his word very effectively. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. He said, For the word of God is living and powerful, 
So it's it's like my dad's word in the natural. It was powerful, man. He had that. He had me down to the eight, seven, eight year old, and what he spoke carried authority and he carried power. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the vision of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart now the word of god that he's speaking here it ain't the bible y'all ain't the bible it's the word that he speaks to you in the situation in which you're living in which you find yourself he's got a word for it so in this growth process as you're maturing as a son he speaks to you a word and I, I want you to notice that that word will divide soul from spirit. Now, the, the soulish part of us is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And the spirit is that which is born of God. So when God speaks to us, and, and the way that you're living, or maybe you're coming through a situation, and the Father speaks a word to you, here's why he's speaking it. He wants to bring you revelation for illumination as to whether you're operating out of soul, which I think we could safely say is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or whether you're operating out of spirit, the tree of life. He's going to help you. The, the word divide asunder is the word merismos. It means to separate. It means to divide into two. And the reason he does that, first of all, is to bring revelation for illumination. He wants you to see that there are two operations going on here. And I'll tell you, when, when you understand that, you can sit back and listen to one battle with the other. The tree of the knowledge, good and evil, the, the, the soulish part is going to tell you what's logical, what's reasonable, what you ought to do, what seems right. And the, the, the spirit, the tree of life over here is saying, mm, this is what the Father is saying, this is what the Father is saying. And you're going to be able to, to watch the two talk to one another almost. And, and you're going to be able to sit back and see this is, this is what's coming. He's giving you revelation for illumination. And so he's, he's bringing you that separation for clarification. He wants you to see what's coming out of your soul so that the soul will learn that it, it becomes exasperated. It, it always works toward failure. And once the soul has failed enough times, it will come humbly to the spirit and submit. So he's bringing, he's bringing revelation for illumination, separation for, for uh, uh, clarification, and then finally he's going to bring the two together. When the, when the soul has worn out, when the soul is tired, when the soul gives up, he comes back with hat in hand and submits to the Spirit. That's when we have unification for cooperation. So in your sonship development, what he's going to do, he's going to rid you of the soulish actions where you're just functioning out of mind, will, and emotions. You know, those are all good. There's nothing wrong with mind, will, and emotions. It just needs to be under the leadership and the tutorage of the Spirit. And where most of us have lived, we've lived the opposite way. When, when you're a child heir, you throw tantrums, you throw fits, you're just immature, you're a baby. But as time goes along and you progress, you begin to learn. And this is where a lot of you are at at the Digital Cathedral. You're beginning to learn that the real success comes, the real happiness of fulfillment comes from eating from the tree of life. So we go, when the Father speaks a word, it's sharp, it's powerful. It divides the soul from the spirit, revelation for illumination. It separates for separation for, for clarification. And then it's going to bring a unification for cooperation. And here's why the unification for cooperation is important in a son. Because we are not to live as dualistic beings. So you can't, you're, you're not supposed to just live, live all the time fighting, fighting one and trying to submit to the other and all that kind of stuff going on in your life. It is to be unification for cooperation where the spirit has absolute control of your life. It calls to shots. And the soul submits. The soul says, yes, if that's the way we are to walk, then that's the way that we, we are to walk. So we, we walk in no dualism. The dualism is eliminated. It's one of the hardest lessons, I think, for uh, sons and daughters to learn is that we are not these tripart beings. Yes, we are. But we don't operate as a tripart being. We operate as one. We operate as 
spirit. We are totally spirit. So the, the, the discipline, the operation of the Father, I, I want you to get down this morning. Father's always good. Now you're a child. He's going to begin to bring into your light, life revelation for illumination, separation for qualification, unification for cooperation. I'm sorry, separation for clarification, unification for cooperation, so that he can bring you into, into being a one. That's how Jesus was. Jesus walked as one. He said, I always do what pleases the Father. I only do what I see the Father do, only say what I hear the Father says. Don't you think at some point when Jesus was growing and maturing that his soul reared up and said, no, we don't want to do that. No, that's not the path we want to take. Don't you think his soul in the garden said, I'm starving to death, man. Turn these stones to bread. Let's get some food going on here. Or if you're really the son of God, come on, I can prove that. I can do it. I'm able. You know, it's like me when I go to the gym at my age. My mind says I, I can lift it. But my body says, are you kidding me? You better not even try. So I've got that. that so I, I've learned, even at the gym, spirit tells me no. Spirit says yes. Spirit says go a little faster. Go. Says no, you better, that's enough for today. Get on home. So you, in every area of your life, you learn to listen and to be led by the spirit. All right, now, <clears throat> I think that's just a good place for me to stop. I'm about 47 minutes into the teaching this morning. Here's what I want. Here's where I want to go next week. I want to start, and I'm just going to disconnect. All right, I'm disconnecting. Next week, I want to start with Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7, and I want to talk about the discipline of the Lord, how he how he how we are to react i've just walked you through a whole bunch of discipline uh how the how the father acts how the father disciplines uh the heart of the father in discipline uh the purpose of it remember revelation for illumination separation for cooperate separation for clarification and unification for cooperation that's the end goal but I'm going to talk to you now next week about how we respond to that. That's it. That's highly important for sonship development. So I'm going to disconnect the train. A few minutes, I'm going to do some teaching for the Grace Awakening Network. And we ain't going to go near this deep on it as, as I've gone this morning. But I want you, I want to get this run in parallel because my burden right now, for some reason, for some reason, I got this burden a couple of three days ago that the manifestation of the sons of God is what's going on in the universe, what's going on in the planet, but people don't know how to react so that they can grow and develop as sons, that they're no longer child heir, that they can be the son whose time has been appointed by the Father and released into having power and authority. So we're going to continue the venture next week. So read, read uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5, 6, and 7, and meditate on it and so that when i hit it next week it'll be fresh bread for you amen thank you for being with me today at the digital cathedral and let me just say thank you for your support man it means so much i'm able to do what i do because of your support your help uh some of the things that you've helped me with has enabled me to stretch the ministry to the grace awakening network uh, I started Global Grace Seminary years ago. It was because I had support from people that enabled me to get it done. So I've got more vision, got things coming up that's going to be exciting, got some, I uh, better not even get into it. I just want to say thank you. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your support. Thank you for being part of the Digital Cathedral. You're part of a worldwide family. And we're learning to grow in wisdom, stature, and favor, not only with God, but with man. See you next Sunday morning, same time. God bless. If your heart has been touched by Don Keithley's words and you believe this ministry can enrich your spiritual journey, we warmly invite you to subscribe and hit the bell icon. By doing so, you'll stay up to date with all the new and inspiring content from the Digital Cathedral, ensuring you never miss out on the transformative power of God's love and grace. You may make a donation at donkeithley.com. We thank you for your continued support and encouragement.